going today. We're here to do the hour being recorded. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming today and, and listening to a uh, talk by Emily Du Michel. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that Spouse Facility, located in Ottawa, is on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. We honor their long history of welcoming many nations to this beautiful territory and uphold and lift the voice and values of our host nation. We mentioned this acknowledgement in an effort to also remind ourselves of the responsibilities we carry as settler organizations and individuals we have to the land and to the people. Just a few quick housekeeping things. You will be muted for now. If you have questions near the end of the thing that you'd like to, to voice, um, we will, uh, you can unmute or you can just ask to be unmuted. Um, on the sidelines here, on behalf of Swell, we have a wonderful Katie who you can ask technical questions to if you want to um, have anything clarified. Please feel free to use that chat function as much as possible. Also, if you have questions throughout the throughout the talk, please do put them in the chat, and we will go from there. Um, uh, the talk should be about an hour. It might go a little bit longer. Please be a little bit flexible. We'll get to some questions at the end. Um, I'm really excited to hear everything. Uh, the artist has to say, and so uh, I hope you are as well. Uh, as mentioned before, this talk will be recorded and presented on the Spell YouTube page. So if you have to go or if something happens weirdly, uh, you make sure that you check the Spell YouTube page in a couple of days and you'll see the video. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Darren Potty. I am the Spell uh, cu Gallery Curator as well as the Spell Residency Coordinator. Uh, if you don't know who Spell is, we are Canada's foremost photographic Arts Centre is housing the only two-year photographic arts diploma in Canada. We have numerous evening and weekend part-time classes, a unique six-month international artist residency, and the only critical and independent gallery in the region dedicated to lens-based art. Currently on exhibition in the gallery, we have Intimate Textures of the Digital World by three artists, Anne-Marie Dumachal, Gilles Thierbiscoute, and Jad Kujus, or uh, Megan O'Brien. The physical world and the virtual one has long been interwoven into our social fabric. We are constantly negotiating between our tactile and corporeal world and the coded digital one. We must orient ourselves between materiality and abstraction or, or coded kind of lens-based world. The works in the in intimate textures of the digital world employ a variety of mediums that flirt with and reject traditional notions of the image or what photography can and might interpret as the image. In order to cap capture a tactile and sensory experience mediated by the lens. Through this mode of inquiry, the artists explore conversations surrounding manual labor, metamorphosis, communication, and belonging. Uh, intimate textures of the digital world reflects our current moment when the reality of uncertain and unstable paths can envelop us. We are faced with a need to reevaluate our standards of experience and search for the comfort of spaces that are constructed by the warp and the web of our tangible and intangible existence. This exhibition was in part um, the result of an open call that SPAO held in January. Uh, it was uh, organized by myself and the creative director that who we noticed themes um, happening with current world events and we wanted to negotiate between the year of half in Zoom, half in real life, half filled with kind of uncertainty and hate and half with connection and being able to talk to loved ones around the world. And something out of that really spoke to these three artists. Um, Gilles Terrebiscuité uh, is presenting uh, a selection of works um, that are made to look like digital renderings, handcrafted wooden sculptures that are about four feet by three feet, huge, huge pieces uh, are photographed and flattened to look like digital renderings. It, they romanticize this kind of digital aesthetic. They also, throw, when I say they flatten, they quite look like, um, things that don't belong in the real world, despite existing uh, quite, quite physically. Um, it mediates our experience and, and talks to still life and, and expands our notion of what that could look like. Wrapped in the Cloud by Jacques Cujus um, was produced at the Making Culture Lab at Simon Fraser University. and was a collaboration with Conrad Sly, Hannah Turner, Reese Montian, and Kate Hennessy. Wrapped in the Cloud is a digital representation of a weaving called Sky Blanket by Jacques Cujus that reveals what our eyes cannot see when looking at the weaving. The otherworldly video reveals the layers that connect community and ancestral knowledge, representing the often inexpressible depths of love and culture. It really presents a new way of 
understanding how we collect objects or how we understand objects. The video provides representation of an object that could not be presented in real life as that object is being born and danced and it is being um, kept within the family. So I think it uh, adds to this idea of, of collecting or being able to be shown worldwide. And here to talk about her own work tonight is Anne-Marie Dumichel. Anne-Marie has developed her artistic practice between Ottawa, Gatineau, and Montreal. She holds a master's degree in visual arts from the University of Ottawa and teaches photography part-time in the same department. She has been a finalist for the 2020 Peter Honeywell Award and recipient of the Culture Ads 2020 Residency Grant. She received grants from Ontario and Quebec Arts Council in addition to having participated in several residencies, including Vermont Studio Centre. Her work has been presented across Canada and internationally. She's renowned for her experimental nature, testing the limits of materiality and abstraction. In my experience, almost all the viewers of her work take that extra step inwards to see the work closer and almost wrap themselves in it, looking to be enveloped and looking for meaning. When you take that step in, you notice that the work often balances incredible professional quality of the physical object mirrored by this kind of graphic. Um, in the work behind me, for example, the plexiglass reflects the viewer, making it seem like you are, could be a part of yourself. Uh, however, in Google, opti Google Optical Spectrum, now on display at the Ottawa Art Gallery, the prints are more matte and they lead to uh, pure color or visual euphoria that, is, um, that, that also envelops you in a completely different way. Anyways, that's just my opinions. Without further ado, I want to welcome Emery Dumichel. Can you hear me well? Yes, oh, okay. Thank you so much for this beautiful and insightful uh, introduction, Darren. It's such a pleasure to have been working with you and the gallery team in the last few weeks, few months. Uh, I felt really much supported and loved and in conversation with all of you. So I, I wanna thank you for that. And Katie as well, who's been hidden right now, but she's been very sweet as well. Uh, the whole community of SPAO, is, uh, is, is beautiful and very dear to me. I have few colleagues in the art world, in the art world and some of them that I really, really love personally, but their work as well. Some of them went through the program at, at SPAO. So to me, it gives me, I haven't studied at SPAO, but it gives me the level of sophisticatedness, if I may say, of this beautiful institution. So it's been such a pleasure to work with you, Darren. Katie, but also uh, John, Michael, that I've known in the past. Um, Olivia, I don't know if she's here tonight, but wonderful team, wonderful community, and I'm thankful to uh, show my work to all of you tonight and to be uh, with you for with all of you tonight. So thank you for tuning in, everyone, uh, tonight. And showing my work with Gilles Tarabis in intimate, uh, intimate textures of the digital world. World and uh, Jade Kudrus as well is a wonderful honor. So uh, I just wanted to start with that and allege that. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, been, it's been wonderful. So thank you, everybody. So uh, what I want to do tonight, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to share my screen right now to give you some visual. I, I hope, yeah, it should work. Let's start. Okay. I think you see my presentation well. All good, okay. So as I told Darren and Katie, uh, I tend to speak a lot, but if there are questions, um, I'm always open to question and interaction during uh, the time I'm talking or afterward, it's, it's really up to you guys and Darren just keep me track on time if, if need to. So I'm, I'm gonna listen to that for sure. Um, so um, it's it's been quite a hectic year for me because I'm just, now we're October 8th tonight, and I'm just out of a residency program, uh, a residency time in uh, Gatineau in the Maison Fairview. That's a big, beautiful house in the middle of Hall. So one of the district in Gatineau. I uh, was by myself for a month making work and reflecting on my photography and art and art practice. So I'm just out of there. So I thought maybe if we have time tonight, I might show you a little bit of the experiment because to be honest, I'm still at the experiment level, but to start, this is what you're seeing here. One of my experimental work uh, that is really, really fresh from residency. So to start, this is what you see here. And for those of you who like their glam metal and their monthly crew, yes, it's a monthly crew 
Lyric there, he's strong and laugh and shout, shout, shout at the devil. So more on that later, I hope. But otherwise, uh, I hope to talk about uh, spectrality, tactility, and regeneration uh, in my work. So these three themes are very, very dear to me. Uh, but particularly in uh, the work that has been presented in the show at SPAL right now in Intimate Textures of the Digital World. Um, so for those of you who've seen the work, uh, and my apologies if I'm a bit abstract right now, but I will have the visual to support everything I'm telling you about in a minute. But for those of you who've seen the flexi work, uh, the very abstract work that I will ex explain how I make them and what they mean to me, uh, on the photographic and artistic and personal level as well, um, just so we, we don't get lost, these works are part of a large series of a larger series of work called Moments of Energy Between Liturgy and Thrills. And each of the image part of that series is called curtain. So in the show, I think we have curtain S. Oh my, I'm even lost myself, but Q, R, and S or something like that. It's like this, this part of that series is there. And um, so I'll talk about these pieces, but also uh, the, I wanted to start by saying that my approach in this talk will be a lot focusing on uh, how I developed that series, how it started, uh, where it's going, and how um, a big series like that, that is, uh, is, the, is, been developed throughout the years. I started these images in late 2016. I'm still working on some of these images. I'm adding to the series. I want to talk on how uh, they, they change over time and how they adapt to um, what I'm doing and the like of other projects and what's going on in the world and in my life and things like that. Uh, I really like to think that art project and what we do is an extension of our person and they do have their personality they do change they do have trait trait uh, in themselves so i like to think as art as something uh, alive and i think i'll make that very clear very soon what i mean by that uh but uh, yeah in, in my presentation i want to talk about uh, the, these work this siri moment of energy between liturgy liturgy and thrill how it started and how do they land in the show as you see them, what happened and what they, what they went through to be what they are now, knowing that the next um, images from that series might change um, as well, because this is what work do. Um, so one thing I, I mentioned a few minutes ago is that I'm just out and I'm very grateful of that. I'm, I'm out of a residency program in Gatineau at Fairview House. That's 2021. The last residency program I did was in 2018, early 2018, so roughly three years ago. Um, I mentioned this because roughly I started to work on the, the Seri Melt, or Moment of Energy Between the Targi and Thrills, ju just before starting that residency, a few months before that. Um, so let, let's take this talk as in terms of time anchor. Uh, that, that residency in Vermont three years ago, and I'll talk about what happened and how it changed to lead us to land uh, in uh, 2021 in uh, Fairview House. So I'll tell you, of course, about these work. I'll tell you a little bit about the, the Polaroids. Well, I'll tell you a lot about the Polaroids also in, in, the, in the show that accompany uh, these work and why they are there, what they need to be in and all that. But I, I might talk about different projects as well to highlight um, my relationship to, to art in general, but in particular, in particular uh, photography as well. So I wanna make transparent uh, my, or visible, my relationship to photography and what it means to me, my favorite medium for sure. So um, yeah. I'll do that. And of course, if we have time, and I think I'll be able to take a little bit of time for that, I'll show you recent, recent work that is not even resolved or anything, but I think it's important to share it with, with people. So some work I, I started doing at, uh, at Fairview House in the last few weeks. Um, so for, for those of you who, who don't 
know me or well just to introduce myself my name is am Duchel. am stands for Anne-Marie, so we can call me Anne-Marie or am um i'm a i'm an artist and and a professor so i think darren mentioned that i teach at ottawa u um i've been involved in uh, different galleries national gallery of canada as well in the education department uh, i have a background in literature and and theater this is pretty much my point of view, my entry door uh, in the world of, of art. But um, as of today, I, I consider myself an artist working with uh, photography. Um, and what's particular into my work is that I, I tend to not use cameras. Uh, so the term lens-based artist, <laughs> I feel it's, I, I, I cannot really fit in there. Or sometimes I do use cameras, Polaroid, 35 millimeters, digital cameras as well. I do use them, but it's not the finality of, of, of my work. Um, I tend to value more uh, alternative processes in photography. So both in the analog world. So I love cyanotype very much. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not gonna show that much today, but I like this idea of a print of something. So photograms as well. I adore Polaroid. Uh, technologies as well. So I work with alternative processes in analog world and the digital as well. I mean, we live with internet. It's an extension of our eyes, our ex our um, our bodies, our experiences. So uh, I tend to appropriate in some project projects. Uh, I appropriate images from the internet uh, into my work, or I can use scanners. I adore scanners because they're um, this office administrative tool that I like to uh, misuse to make work. So scanning is very important to me. Um, also uh, Photoshop or just this editing um, software or room where you can build your own image that really exists outside this idea of the index to me is very, very dear to me. So I, I like to use alternative processes. Um, and, and the idea for me is, is not to take a picture, but to craft a photographic image and, and to craft it through a process of transformation of data that I either collected or created uh, by, by, mis, by myself. And the results tend to be uh, extended collages, uh, assemblage of, of images. So I, I really, really insist on this. It's not that subtle, but this difference, I don't take photos, I, I craft them, but they're still photos to me. Uh, this is uh, what I do. So this idea of transformation, metamorphosis, is in the heart of every, pretty much every project uh, that uh, I, I do. Um, I adore large scale uh, installation and work as well, but in the last few years, I tried to work very, very, very small, very, mini, mini scale uh, as well. But the idea of being enveloped by images is quite important to me. Um, and uh, of course, I've been integrating sculpture, installation, and music. I hope I could make you hear a, a music I'm working on that is related to photography. It's not gonna be possible to back tonight, but another time, we'll have another time for that. But uh, more and more, I integrate into my work, the sense of space, installation, sculpture, and other medium uh, as well. And um, it's, it's so hard, I find, to reduce what, whatever we all do in one sentence. But a uh, few years, I got pretty good. And uh, I like to say that I'm, I'm interested in human experiences on the biological level, physical level, emotional level, relational level, administrative level. I'm, I'm interested in those human experiences, but in the era of screen. Screen means internet, means your phone, mean, mean, mean this flat mediator between you and the world. I'm interested in, in that. And always through a, a feminine perspective. Um, yeah, yeah, which I, Ada, which I, which I identify to. So uh, I hope that gives you a bit of information about what I, what I do and where I'm coming from. Um, I also, I wanted to 
share this quote by Derek Yarman, one of my favorite writers in the book Chroma that has been published in, ooh, I think, 1993. Um, before I jump into this beautiful quote, uh, I just want to share an anecdote with you. Uh, well, in 2018, when I was in Vermont, uh, at Vermont Studio Center, I was lucky enough to have a studio visit by Gregory Coates, a wonderful American painter. Is I, I just have to say this, I think he's the most generous, loving, sharing person I've ever met in my whole life. As an artist, he was so present for all of the uh, artists in, in the residence himself that I just have to say, he's a wonderful soul. And in my studio visit, we just, you know, I, I share with him what I do and I say a few words about it and we have a conversation. And at some point, he, he tells me that, um, he, for, okay, so Gregory Coates is a painter, um, abstract painter, but he's also very interested in social practices uh, as well. Um, and he was sharing with me how he knew as an artist what he was doing. But at some point, a few years before I, I met with him at, in Vermont, he was sharing with me how at some point he had to ask himself what's beneath all of that, between beneath all of what he thinks, what he knows he likes, and beneath underneath all the reasons you know why they make art. If you have to reduce it to one thing, what is it that he loves the most to making art? And so he asked himself this, this question, his partner asked this question to him and he answered, his answer to that question was lines. Uh, and he likes lines. And then why does he like slime? Well, verticality, horizontality, and then it becomes a metaphor for social relationship. But the idea of lines was so important to him. So when he realized that, doors, you know, conceptual artistic doors open uh, to him. Uh, so sharing with me that anecdote, he was telling me, what is this thing for you? And of course, on the spot, I, I couldn't really answer that beautiful deep question it took me times to to answer but i realized that for me the most important thing into my world beyond photography beyond uh, the idea of the screen what what is it what is this main thing that i'm attracted to and to me and we all have different answers to that of course but to me it was colors uh, and when i realized that i started to ask myself why do i love colors so much uh, and I realized, well, it's been over 15, 20 years of my art. So, and it's always worked with photography or videos or everything was so saturated with colors and so strong and so, yeah, so colorful that, oh, there's something there. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll keep that for after. But I, I started to read a lot about colors and I'm very attracted to literature, to auto theory as well. So I read. For, well, I know I'm touching just the tip of the iceberg, but uh, I read, for instance, a Bluets by uh, Maggie Nelson, um, a, cr a Chroma here by Derek Yarman, and the other one, uh, uh, Chromophobia, cr uh, Chromophobia by David Bachelor as well. And these are all different essays about colors, but I love Derek Yarman in Chroma. Um, so I'll just read it to you. Um, brilliant, gorgeous, painted gay. Vivid, flaunting, tear away, glowing, flaring, lurid, loud, screaming, shrieking, marching, proud, mellow, matching, deep and somber, pastel, sober, dead and dull, constant, colorful, chromatic, party, colored and prismatic, kaleidoscopic, very jaded, tattooed, dyed, illuminated, dub and stumble, dip and die, high kid color color lie. The further color recedes in time and space, the stronger it glows. Derek Yarman was living with uh, HIV and he developed AIDS at the end of his life in the early 1990s. Um, uh, he was, eyesight became different for him and he was seeing a lot of blue, uh, uh, like everything was blue filtered. So he wrote a lot about colors, made a movie about that. And um, 
I'm in love with this idea of describing colors, not in a chemical way, not in a social way, but or a political way, but through a personal, personal mythology filter or a experiential point of view. I was really, really touched uh, by that. So that's why, to me, that that, um, that quote is very important. And this idea that color lie as well, to me, meant a lot of things. It's this idea of whatever you think you see, whatever you, idea you have of yourself, of your reality, maybe it's not a lie, but there might be a thousand other perspectives out of that. So that's how I, I took it. And I think we can all take this uh, in different ways, but it was a beautiful quote for me. Um, and also, I'm from a, a mid-class French Canadian um, environment, which means uh, colors were everywhere, kitsch was everywhere, and you know, little knickknacks and things like that. It, it's it's part of, of the culture where where I'm from. So um, understanding that I love colors so much that eventually it came from my love and. I, when I say kitsch, I mean it in the most admiring, beautiful way. My love and um, internalization of the kitsch culture as well uh, became such a big influence for me to, uh, to use colors. So, yeah, all that to say that color is very, very important for me. And I've been sensitive over the years of where that love is coming from. It's come not just from me loving colors, it comes from a family tradition, cultural tradition as well. So I'm more and more sensitive to, um, to, to that. I'm just reading my notes on sharing. Okay. Um, so all I, I just share with you, I just hope it's a bit of a subtext too to the work that I want to share with you uh, tonight, right? Just little things to keep in mind that I don't want to uh, describe before I jump uh, into this. So you're probably familiar with what you're seeing right now. And I see uh, Darren sitting right in the corner. I can piece it together. Look at that. <laughs> that that's very nice. Um, so yeah, that's my work in um, intimate textures of the digital world. Um, what's in there? It's Three work from the series Melt, so Moments of Energy Between Lethargy and Thrill. Oh, yeah, okay. You see my arrow, right? Yeah, okay. So we have this one. It's just, to, this is more of a technical thing, but it's 44 inches by 66 inches. This one, oh my God, I'm not even going to dare try to see the, the letters, but it's what we'll, we'll know very soon. It's one of the Melt from the Melt series this one as well, and this one uh, as well. They're all the same sizes, 44 by 66. 66. Uh, they are printed on plexiglass. So uh, that means there's an inject print that has been done, that has been reversed, that has been glued behind a piece of plexiglass, and they are split button behind them. So they're hanging on the wall with, I believe, a quarter, a quarter inches from the wall and behind them also if I just want to sit this if we don't sit too clearly but I invite you if you ever go into space and you may experience physically the work you will notice that behind each of these three big work there's a hollow a yellow hollow because there's a yellow print behind as well to have some kind of hollow or reflection coming out of them I just wanted to make this technical description with you uh, there's that, and there's also two work, uh, two Polaroid diptychs called the Vanitas, and I'll describe them a bit more later on, but I wanted to sit right away. So these two artworks over here, um, these diptych of Polaroids called Vanitas. All right, so I'll talk about the Vanitas a little bit later on. Now I want to focus more about on, on, on these melt moments of energy between the target and real work, just to describe to you what, what they are um, about. Oh, there you go, S, oh, no, I'm curious. S, O, and R, okay. Okay, 
Um, so, um, I assume you see me. Because I have something physically to, to share with you. Um, so, so these work, I, I might repeat a little bit what I said before, but I started a while back, so at the end of 2016. Um, and when we work by Siri, I don't know if some of you are working with Siri, maybe not, but it's the first Siri I'm really working throughout the years and it takes time uh, to make those images and they adapt to different, different projects that I am doing, which is the case here. But uh, yeah, I started in 2017, so it's ongoing. And you notice the letters. So for this one here, it's called curtain S, I call them curtains, S, O, and R. That kind of situates you in the alphabet because my goal is to go to Z. But I'll be, I'll do the curtain Z, 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 I'll, I'll be done. So I'm now at T, I believe, so getting there, but when I'll be at Z, that's gonna be the end of uh, the series. That gives you a sense of the time and where I wanna go. So I wanna have 26 of them. Um, they are large size. I, I think I, I told you the dimensions already, 20, no, 44 by 66 inches. Um, and what they are, they are digital images printed on either matte paper, but in this case, as you know, on, on plexiglass. And um, a lot of people ask me, like, what do you photograph? What, what did you do here? What's going on? So uh, without giving you a sense of a recipe, I want to give you a sense of how, what, what they are and what they are the result from. Um, I, I really like to describe them. Oh, I'll, I'll stay here for a while. Um, a sense of these images um, are the result of a reanimation process. Uh, me trying to revive something and that something has a source and these are Polaroids. So I'm showing you through my computer, through my window, window right now. Um, I, it's not even a, well, it's probably an unconscious theme for me, but I call them my de dead Polaroids. Uh, since I'm a student in the BFA, so about 18 years ago, I, I take Polaroid pictures and you, you know how Polaroids can be. If you dare to be a bit experimental, you can be disappointed <laughs> very fast with those. It's really e easy to have, um, to have expired chemicals, to have bad frames Polaroid because you, you have to learn that they're not SLR. Their point and shoot, so you might not um, um, frame correctly. Things get blurry easily. The exposure is not good. So over the time, me loving Polaroid, I managed to gather a good collection of failed Polaroid, either bad uh, uh, chemicals or badly framed, badly developed, and things like that. And um, so I, I collected them throughout the years thinking I would never do anything with those, but what do you do with a Polaroid? You, you're not an animal. You're not gonna put that in the trash. You need to keep it. Need to. So um, I, I kept them and at some point I said, well, let's, re, let's try to reanimate those images. So for instance, right now, what you're seeing is curtain O, it's part of the show. Um, yeah, it's part of the show, this one. And what I'm telling you, it's, the, it's what I do for each of them. So I take two of these, failed Polaroid or dead Polaroid. So each big images, each curtain is two Polaroid. I scan them to have a digital um, file of them. And then I take these two digital file and I animate these two Polaroid through um, uh, a GIF animation. So GIF, we see them all the time, but here let's, let's just, uh, think of GIFs as pulsation between two images. Either a fast one, and you see what it, the impact it has, either a slow one, but this pulsation, I make it this GIF, I make it play on my uh, computer, and then I scan my computer that showcase the GIF, therefore the pulsation, the heartbeat, I like to use that word, the heartbeat of these images. And so from that animation I scan, and then I have, um, I have an image uh, that to me becomes 
a digital DNA of something very chemical or um, um, like I, I wrote the best sentence. That's why I hesitate right now. Oh my God, I have to read that sentence. Oh yeah, yeah. A digital embroidery that reveal parts of the Polaroid because sometimes you get a sense of space in some of them or light or space. You get a sense of the original Polaroid. You get that, but you also get the, the curtain of the moire effect. So these tram lines over there that result from the confrontation of two um, digital technologies getting together. Um, yeah, so it's an embroidery of both the digital world, but the actual Polaroid um, as well. And, um, I, I adore that, that texture. And what results from that is an unsaturated <laughs> image, but with uh, Photoshop, I managed to just boost the colors and maybe do a few tweaks, but they're really minimal. And that's the result um, of, of this process. This is what you, you see um, over there. So uh, to me, this work is about um, three main things. So this, I, this idea of reanimating of course something dead that becomes alive again so the polaroid has been revived into a digital image um i mean for those of you who, who are interested in the theory of photography we know how photography has been associated to death because of this moment of capturing something that never comes back to you photography means death to me it's it's a different take on that but it's it's my way to jump <laughs> into that dramatic reality of photography. Um, yeah, so reanimating something that, that is dead. Um, also, I'm not an essentialist feminist at all. I don't think femininity has to do strictly with the ability of giving birth. So I just want to make that clear. Femininity can be so many things, whatever we want it to be. But I like to create um, a photography process that doesn't rely on cameras, doesn't rely on uh, the, the mechanic that was appropriated by modernity, by the 19th century, by industrial um, mindset of the 19th century as well. I like to go around it, you know, I, I like to go around it to offer something that could be uh, closer to a feminine mindset. Um, so I, I like it for that. And also, well, the result, um, yeah, I'll show you another one. Oh, this is curtain R in the show. This is curtain A, that's the first one I've ever done. And it's hard to look at, and I'll give it to you. <laughs> well, on the screen, it can be one thing, but when you're in front of it, it's like, whoa, it, you're buzzing. I, I heard a lot that word. Yeah. Like it's visually very stimulating. Um, but I, I'm a big fan of, of art and abstract painting in Quebec in the 1950s, 60s, the neoplasticien Guido Molinari and uh, Claude Tuzignan, for instance, who really work with strong colors and shape that makes you, when you see them, you're just simply aware of your ability to see. And I, I was happy I could do that with photography, with the language of photography um, itself. So I, I prepared some close up to the images as well, just to show you, yeah, to show you a detail of how it works. So I can tell right away this image, so you know how it's been done with a Polaroid that gives, I can tell it was fairly fast, the pulsation, because you can see the embroidery or the, the little squares that is created. It means it goes from an animation to a second one. So you see it's, it's quite tight here. The tighter it is, it means the faster the animation was. And I don't have the Polaroid, but you would recognize the Polaroid with this. And at the opposite, this is a bit slower, because you can tell the shapes are looser. I made this one for Laurence Gilbert. I don't know if she's here tonight, but I made it this one for her. So this one is very tight. This one too, but this one, because we can tell there, there are very thick layers 
of colors and uh, of embroidery, I may say, like these, like these lines here, here, here. I can tell it was a slow, well, slow, a slower uh, GIF of animation. So uh, this is how I, I, I make them. If there are questions right now, I'll... Oh. Um, I presented these images uh, to my mother. My mother is probably the most artistic person I know, but she doesn't make art at all. She's not, but she, she loves art. She, she loves it uh, very much. And the first time I invited her to see one of my shows, excuse me, with these images in there, uh, I explained to her everything I just explained to you, how I made them, what they made for me, artistically and photographically, and, and why do I do them? And I give her that spiel, and her response to me was uh, something that I didn't expect at all. But uh, she said, oh yeah, it's beautiful, whatever you say, it's, it's, but now all I see is your mother's, is your grandmother quilt, quilt, no quilting? Do I see the quilt? Yeah, okay. Uh, and I, I never thought of my work like that, but that night I went back home and I, I have a few quilts that my grandma, grandmother, but also my grand grandmother, so the mother of my grandmother made, and I'm, I have I've had them with me and I unfolded them. And it's so crazy to see the resemblance. And um, so you have one example of, my grandmother's quilt over here from the 1960s. And that's her mother who made that in the 1940s. And, and you know the kind of material that will never die, <laughs> that will always stay intact. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful I have them, but that comment was quite insightful for me because um, that comment that was just made out like this helped me see my work differently. Helped me see my... Uh, Help me understand my love of colors, but the reason why I do what I do as well. And um, so that changed a lot for me, uh, that comment, because I never thought of my work like that, but there it is. Uh, it's very, very similar. Uh, quilt is taking pieces, if I think, especially this one over here, taking pieces of fabric, putting them together and recreate something bigger, like a collage, like an assemblage. It's, it's exactly what I do, especially in my consciousness of the fact that we're having so many images out there. Let's make something else with that. So I started to connect uh, the dot on a more personal level on why I do the art uh, I do. And, and uh, I'm saying this, and I might sit later just to situate, but it's not something I, want, uh, I will talk about too much because it, it's not the point. But uh, it's, it was uh, very hard to understand that because I'm very estranged to these women. I, I don't really know them, or the history of family is, you know, marked with conflict and, and you know, more negative feelings uh, as well. So it, this realization was absolutely beautiful, but also come with a lot of questions. And um, I, I just have the word misunderstanding in my head, or anyway, come with me trying to. I'm thinking in French, apprivoiser. Uh, I hope I translate that good or that this was good, but apprivoiser to, uh, yeah, a new situation uh, like that. And to reinsert myself as well in a family tradition, but a cultural tradition that I tend to, for some reason, conscious or not, I tend to push away. So it changed a lot for me. Yeah. Um, Flesh and Stones, one, two, and three. This is a triptych I've done in 2017 in the context of uh, the exhibition called Continuum uh, at Karsh Maison. And that exhibition was about celebrating young artistic, uh, young photographers in Ottawa gets Norwegian. Uh, and I, I was not the only one part of that exhibition. There was, I'll come back to this in a second. It was 
I'm just happy to see it. There was uh, uh, Meryl McMaster here, Olivia Johnstone, who's a working and alumni of SPAO, Leslie Osak, um, as well, there was Julia Martin, Joy Arcan, and uh, I'm, I'm missing one, I'm so sorry. It's gonna come back to me. But there were seven of us uh, showing work in the context of continuum, and that's the work I was doing there. Um, I don't wanna talk too much about this work, but I put it there because I think it really highlights my, um, my approach to photography. I, I've been talking about that early on, but I think it adds a little bit of, of something over here. So flesh and stone is a triptych. Each images, each image of that series, there are collage, digital collages. They are 20 inches by 80 inches. And again, they are all um, printed on plexiglass and, and hang on the wall, uh, a half an inch from the wall. And because it's plexiglass, and Darren, I know you mentioned that at the beginning, and I was so happy that you, it's something you, you, you enjoy about the work, the fact that you reflect yourself in the work, that, that's a very important dimension for me. And this one in particular was quite, um, quite, it worked quite well with this idea of reflection in yourself. So all of these images are scanning of all kind of position I had and pieces of flesh over there. And they were jewelries, all kind of little knickknacks that I received through time from my mother and grandmother. So this is what in these, and at the end we have this kind of an, this anthropomorph, these three anthropomorphic figures that exist somewhere in between the, the blurry line of portrait uh, and still lives um, as well. And I like to think of them as very threatening feminine uh, figures. Um, yeah, yeah. I just want to show you details. Um, so uh, they're all scanned object. Um, yeah, they're all scanned objects. And through the process of scanning, I go totally with your board on my, um, on my, on my scanner. So there's a bit of movement. And then in the process of working those images, uh, post edition way, uh, they are also a little well, a little bit, that's a big lie. They're a lot manipulated, as you can tell over here. Um, so that's why I added some detail over here to show you how much um, changed, uh, manipulated they are in the images because I totally own it. And um, I use, one thing I wanted to mention about my love for color in the photography and especially these ones as well. I've been told in time to tone down colors, tone down shapes, tone down these kind of things. And I, and I, of course, completely understand this discourse, but it was very difficult for me to tone down this whole thing. Um, the thing is, when you don't tone down, you need to understand why you don't tone down. And, um, but yeah, it, uh, I like this idea of bringing forward the work I was doing with these images, because work means something transforming an image uh, well no transforming an object that exists whatever you have you scan them you digitalize them it's a transformation even though it's a pure photograph digital or analog photograph of it it's an image it's no longer a thing it's an image there's your transformation um so to bring that thought in the digital world um, um to me, it just made sense to really transform everything and make it become, become its own uh, thing. Um, yes. I like this idea of monument. Oh, I feel like I just opened a big door. Uh, I, I just want to mention one thing, but uh, the monument being uh, this thing you create that can carry everything, all your good or bad feelings that you put into one uh, creation that holds all of your identity to an event that therefore through the work being a transformation, uh, transformative entity of what you felt, uh, hold it and become separate of you. This idea is very, very dear to me. Um, so this is how I, I see the work, but um, I also wanted to bring forward the work that is actual photographic work, but is metaphoric for something else. 
as well. To me, that, that was important. Uh, and the main reason why I show them to you is to, I don't want to be too theoretic here, but there was a reading I, I've done that I, I wanted to share with you. It's W.J.T. Mitchell um, in 1992 wrote a text called um, The Reconfigured Eye, Visual Truth in the Post-Photographic Era. I think I just said it, it's 1992. Um, but in, in this text, it's the, really the beginning, beginning, beginning of digital uh, imagery making, something that becomes slowly, slowly um, democratized. And uh, Mitchell makes a, di uh, different, different, uh, makes a difference between analog photography and digital photography. In his opinion, he, he, he thinks that any digital technology that allows you to make a photo, it's not a photo. It's not a photo anymore. It's something else. You're in the post photographic world. Because if you take a film, well, you have a physical chemical print of something in, in front of you, in front of a camera. That's one thing. But when you fall into the digital uh, world, um, it's it's a data transformation of colors and light that becomes pixels. So just for him, the differentiation, uh, the difference between those two processes is enough to see that digital photography, don't bother think it's the same way. Um, it's all about computer pixels and transformation. So celebrate uh, the, um, the digital tools and the computer and all of that. And uh, I love that text very much because it, it doesn't give me a license to do what I do, but it, it kind of proved to me that, yeah, oh yeah, computer and um, Photoshop, they are what they are. They are language. They, are, they have their own set of rules and they are an extension of what I think we, we attach to, to photography. Uh, so, I, I mean, it's not truth. It's just my entry point into these things as well. So that's why I wanted to show it. Here. So WJT Mitchell, the reconfigured eye for those of you who enjoy. Uh, are we doing good on time? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. So I I told a lot about regeneration, this idea of reanimating uh, an image and the more feminist approach to to photography and the tool itself um i want to talk a bit talk a little bit about tact tactility and uh the physical aspect of uh, photography so three four oh my god almost four years ago in vermont um i i just started to work on the melt series so these photos these digital collages part of the show at spa i started to work on them so i had a few with me that I decided to bring uh, in in Vermont, and this this um, um, this residence for me was all about thinking: How can you liberate a photograph? How can you make a photo work on its set of rules, make an image, but present it in a way that it's not a prison? Uh, I, I say that because I'm. I'm the queen of making a photo and frame it and it's on the wall. And I wanted to break that two dimensionality of presentation. Uh, so I started to print the work. So you might recognize, of course, some of the melt images, the curtains. But I print, I cut, I really worked with the paper um, to, to, to make those crazy sculpture that exists in between this organic shape um, uh, almost clothes, but it's all paper that has been tear apart, tear apart and, um, and, and reconfigured uh, into a sculpture. And they're all on the wall. <laughs> That's the thing. Uh, but I really wanted to make a three D version of these of these um, of these photo and work as um, as as an object as well. Uh, I also scan a little bit over there, I scan all kind of objects related to the body, to the body. 
So making these objects is just the only thing I did over there and I spray painted. So what you're seeing right now, uh, it's the same sculpture, but seeing on different angles. So it's, it's the same one. And I'm, I, I call it my whale. Um, and yeah, there's spray paint in there. There's some uh, pictorial intervention right behind the prints as well. They're tear apart, they're hanging on the wall and it's about six foot high, just to give you a sense of um, of, of the dimension. So it's a very, very experimental um, residence, residency for me, but um, to work with sculpture, to work making an object out of a photo to me really helped me connect my ideas better um, and also create more sensorial uh, interaction with the public. I, I really think that to put an object that has a shape uh, on its own um, has an impact on how people can consume an image uh, as well. So all of these realizations came, uh, came to me. And of course, this reflection on material uh, back then, well, also if you do a residence in the States, you don't wanna bring back big stuff that is heavy. <laughs> so just paper is good out there. I, and I work with paper, but, uh, and I love working with paper and the vulnerability, no, let me rephrase, let me, uh, vulnerability of paper is so fragile it's 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 so uh, regard upon it's at least i do it's just paper but paper has such um a, a weight uh, as such a fiber as such a feel to it that exists between many discipline uh, that I really, really adored working uh, with that, but it opened the door to really reflect on materiality and as well, speciality. Uh, speciality, being in a space itself. Yeah, you have the space. I'll, I'll stop them for now. I just want to check the chat because I see there. Are... Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, thank you, Darren, for posting the, um, the text by Mitchell. Thank you. Can you give us an example of the object that you can scan to begin uh, creating these images? Uh, Phil, yeah, absolutely. So I, I hope I can connect the dot with what I see here. So for example, over there, the object I scan over there, these, these little flyers over there, these little things that looks like flags, uh, they are antibiotic pockets because me, I, I have like a beginning of arthritis in my hand. So it makes it very difficult for me to work physically with things. So I'm very awkward at working with, you know, small details. And I was cutting those images and I severely cut my finger and I needed, you know, all of these, uh, taking care of this. And uh, I abuse these little antibiotic packet pocket over there. So there's that, there's pieces of leather in there, everything related to the body. So whenever I scan, uh, just, I hope I answer your question well, but whenever I scan objects around me, it's not random. It always comes with a set of rules. Uh, once I did a series of scanning with um, object uh, that are all pink in my house, that, that's the rule. Over here, if they were object uh, related to body, so I cut my finger. So of course there's antibiotic. Uh, there were, I forget what it was. I'm just a bit on the spot, but yeah, leather, some clothes, uh, a lot of wool as well. So what do you have when you scan wool? <laughs> what, can, what kind of image can you get? So these, time, these kind of things to get. Oh, there's a lot of pills. Yes, I just see them. Pills, I, I need trazodone to sleep sometimes. So there's some trazodone in there and colors are for manipulated. So everything related to body and regulating the body. So they're really medical when I think about it. So um, yeah, so that, that is for these ones. Uh, scanning with melt, well, of course the Polaroid, but there's always a set of rule. Uh, Trish, do you personally oversee every installation or do you, or do these display differently at every exhibit? I, I think I'm a control freak. Yeah, I, uh, or no, yeah, I don't know. Well, to me, making an exhibition in the space, it's, it's a medium as well. And you want to have, it's not about being control freak. I don't know why I said that. Um, but it's really about knowing what kind of experience, special experience you want to give 
to the viewers and that I think differs from space to space. So yeah, I like, I like, I like to be involved when I know I'm making, um, um, I, I'm making, you know, a show with all of my work. But the cool thing about Spau right now, I didn't oversee this and I like to have a gallery input into how they put the work together. And that feeds me as well as an artist. And I, I love that. I like to have the output, output of curators, of people working with Darren who um, might have a different way to put things together, but it makes me see new things as well. So I think it depends on the context. If it's a solo show, it's one thing, but I really like to uh, give space to other people who put the, thing, put the show together when there are, especially when there are other artists involved. I think that's, that's the part where I, I need to pay attention and learn from the work, from the experience. And so that's, that's a good part, yeah. Uh, there, was a, there was an earlier question that might lead into yeah. a, a much longer thing, but um, the question which is, which piece in your series resonates most with you? But I, I'm looking to elaborate, how do you go from experimentation, experimentation to complete object? You know, how, do you, how do you know when something's done and you get that resonation? You know, how, how do you, like for me, when I see your work and I know I, I, I love it, it's, it's like a spark, it's like a, my heart beats literally faster and there's like an element of something there. And so I guess this question is A, which, which piece resonates with you, but also how do you know when it's ready to show it to other people? How do you know it's, it's, it's done, so to speak? And maybe it's never done. Maybe you just say, okay, you know, that's it. I have to stop working or, or, or maybe um, you say, no, I, I've done it enough, but we're good. That's, uh, and as I speak, I'm gonna go a bit faster in the, in the slides, but that's a very, good question that I, I don't know if I can answer correctly yet, but to me, it has a lot to do with the space because this is what I lack the most, being working on, on a computer all the time, you know your image, you know when it's done, it's like, oh yeah, it's good, you know that, but to make it exist and extract it from your computer and to make it exist in the world and interact in the world, that's, um, that's a very different experience. And to me, it becomes complete. Yeah, I know when an image is complete because I, I get my, my set of rules and you're looking at miniature work as well here. Um, yeah, you know when it's done, but to me, I feel there's a thousand version of the image that could exist, but whatever I take it out, print it and make it exist in the context of a space, and for me, that means making the work interact with your some of other work. It could be yours, could be others. Um, I'll, no, I'll keep the idea of mine. I think because there's a clear reason for that. I, I think that's what it is. Uh, I think what makes the cut, especially for me, is when it becomes uh, physical. Uh, yeah, I think that's, <laughs> that's how I can answer it for now. But I think it's the hardest question when you know it's done. Yeah, there's this hard felt thing that I personally feel I'm always esoteric when I say that, but it's so true. It, it is, it, it just is, you, you just know. And because you can be, you can, I can easily become my own um, rule prisoner. And that doesn't give you the space to really evolve into your work. Because art, I said the word recipe with a lot of what it sounds earlier because of that. Uh, so I don't know, there's maybe a heart element. And, but yeah, in a nutshell, the answer to that is whenever I know the work is done, when I can make it interact in a larger concept of what images in a concept of a, of a physical space. Um, oh yeah, I'm, and I'm almost done. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to keep you up all night, oh my God. Um, so just to give you an entry, um, an anchor point um, about how the images at the gallery seen in the inti um, intimate textures in the digital world that happened there, um, I work these images in the context of a solo show called De la Chair vers l'os, which roughly translate to from, from flesh to the bone, so it's a very bodily title. So that show happened a few months back in June. Uh, and um, the, sh the show happened because again, it's a relationship with family. So what you see over there, they're all fake uh, and plastic flowers that belong to uh, my grandmother. So a person I'm more estranged with, but that still have you know, impact in relationship with some people in the family. So 
uh, you know, she's very, very advanced in age, uh, and she suffered a stroke two years uh, ago. So now she went from uh, being in at home in her home, um, in a big home in Gatineau, uh, and that home to me, when I think of it, looked like Anne Holben, the ambassador. <laughs> she decorated it in the in her own way with all kind of object of curiosity that she has all kind of very good um, real jewelry, but also artificial uh, jewelry. She loved these things. I think I said that to connect it with my love of kitsch and artificial flowers everywhere as decoration. And so after happened what happened, she transferred from her house to uh, Residence de Personnes Âgées. I'm sorry, I can't say that in English, but uh, Residence for Elder. Um, yeah, it, it, it's just what it is. And so we, when that happened, uh, my mother and me and other people were in charge to, you know, taking care of her stuff, making sure it's okay. And I've been, I've been granted the permission to take a few things to keep it with me. Uh, and these fake flowers speak to me so much. And what you see there, there, some of them are hers, some of them are, were mine. So I blended all together, but that became the primary material to make um, a project about memento mori, but also uh, forgiveness and, and love and uh, luminous um, relationship to transformation of craft and things like that. So subject I already touched with all of you. So these flowers are starting to, uh, oh yeah, Jeyad. Isn't it the most glorious rock you've ever seen in your whole life? I think to me, I did. Yeah. Uh, so I scan all of these real rocks and objects and jewelry and not flowers, but different things. But uh, also, yeah, I, I scan all of these things to the manner I already explained. Um, the skull is mine. I just had to put it there because for me, these objects, I mean, flowers and, and, and rocks become symbols related to the tradition of Memento Mori. So um, I, I scanned them, transformed them a little bit to make installation. Uh, and memento maries like that in the honor in the honor of, of of that person and my family but it's it cannot be taken literal it's more of this of this idea of memento mori as uh, a symbol for transformation metamorphosis which means forgiveness um moving on transformation but also transformation of craft the idea of craft into from the handmade analog way to my own way, which is a digital one uh, as well. Uh, it's also the celebration of kitsch object that is was quite important for, for her in her own way and my mother and me in my own way, this continuation of that. So to me, this theme of Memento Murray is, is, a, is loaded with many, many things, but overall it's celebration and liberation uh, as well. So this is, um, yeah, the, the tombeau, the tomb that was there. It's a floor piece. Uh, in the show de la Chaverlas, few, uh, and I'm not, not going to talk about that too much. But there was a lot of small, small miniatures, those miniatures as well. And the idea of hand, um, this figure of the hand is very important for me now. Uh, hand as a symbol of making, the makers. Uh, but also me, I understand that whenever I scan something. Um, and some of you might know what I mean by that. You know, when you scan something and you hold it, uh, when, when you have to work with your image, most of the time, this idea of removing what's not the object is important. Removing your hand, removing the blurriness, removing all that. But um, having everything you already know I have in my mind, having the hand to bring my own hands back in the work was, was meaningful. <laughs> so these are my hands over there smaller miniature. This one is about oh, a centimeter big. It's part of the show, so I'm going quite uh, fast into what the show looked like, but there was the room was full of miniatures as well. Very, very, very tiny, tiny work. And what you see over there is it's a ring. It's actually, even if I'm not wrong, it's blowing up um, a diamond or a stone on a ring very larger than what it was. So it's a miniature, but it's still this idea of blowing up something that is really small. So la matière première, so the, 
what I work with over here, someone asked me the great question of what do you scan with? Well, it's all scanning the objects that belong to um, my maternal grandmother to make it my own and have a reflection about my relationship with family and culture as well. Um, yeah, different fabrics as well, miniature. And of course, in the show, I included these melt, these curtains, uh, because they're no longer just pictures well just they're no longer picture of a polaroid transform into something else in digital images they're also my version of crafting of crafting an image over there so that's what i meant i think at the beginning when i said oh i think this whole presentation is about um you know how this series melts transform through time that's a good manifestation of that so everything you see in uh intimate texture in the digital world is these images and of course uh, very quickly and i'll end on that i promise um yeah just a second to see these there are also the vanitas so you will see Vanitas 1, Vanitas 3, and I do have two more. They are Polaroid diptychs. And they are the pairing of one Polaroid used to create one of the melt images. So one of these. So the bad Polaroid that has been paired with the still life that I created. So this one, these are Oyas, a plant that has been given to me by my arrière grandmère like years ago before she passed away. And this one, oh, I have it. I have a detail to show you just quickly in a second, but it's uh, a pairing of all of these fake kitsch jewelry that belonged to my grandmother. I made a collage out of that, photographed it, and it's paired with one of the failed Polaroid images. So it's really this idea of connecting things over here. So I'll show you. Oh, it's a very bad image here. I'm so sorry about that. And these ones over here. So I'll stop here for now. If there are any questions or, or comments, I'll be more than happy to answer. I just, uh, right off before when people start putting questions in the chat or, or raise their hand and we can uh, talk, but um, I did have a question. You know, when, when I first saw these, I also thought about quilts for the first time. My grandmother, my great-grandmother from Louisville, in Quebec and Chadigui in Quebec. That's the first thing that, I, that brought me to, but more specifically, you kind of touch on this idea of kind of feminism or inherent kind of femininity within some of your work. And I just wanted to know some of your, like, maybe could you expand that a little bit, maybe? And, and the fact that it's your maternal grandmother is kind of passed down that line, or um, does, does that make sense? Uh, maybe could you expand on some of those ideas? Um, if it's been given to me? Yeah, yeah. So, so if your work, work is rooted in, in some, in, in feminine or feminism, sorry, excuse me. Uh, how does abstraction kind of aid you in that exploration or how does this kind of tie in or, or does it, or maybe I have that wrong. The fact that these are abstract images. Mm -hmm. Oh, they are? Well, I, I don't know if it's because they are abstract images, but I, I think it's the way I made them that reveal like um, um, a DNA uh, of previous images. So I think I talk a little bit about the fact that these are not taking an image, but to generate, to produce an image from A to Z. To me, it's really related to uh, the process of, or it's at least metaphorical to family. So of generation to generation. So to produce these images, give that. But also if I may just go back very quickly, uh, they, they are abstract because I mean, everything can be abstract. And I, I told a little bit about my love for abstraction because of of art and uh, things like that. Uh, but looking very close to them, I, I like, okay, yeah, this is where I wanna go. It really feel like um, wool or um, a digital fabric, literally like that. So to me, that's probably the main reason why I like to connect them with, uh, with what I showed early, uh, early on, I would say these one over there. I think it's a digital translation for me of what I see, what I know, and what I cannot do as well. I, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure if that was your question or not, but no, I cannot sew, I cannot do anything like that. Nobody taught me, I, I, maybe one day I will, I, I hope so, but it's not something I've learned on for so many reasons. 
Uh, but one of those reasons is the fact that I'm a bit estranged from this part of, of my family as well. So it's something I, I like, maybe consciously or unconsciously, but I, I like to think that this work is a way to, is my way to connect with this tradition. I hope I answer your question well. Yeah, that's exactly, that was exactly, okay. yeah, perfect. I think I worded that really wrong, but that's exactly what I was thinking. Okay. And um, Trish said, I remember a lot of knickknacks around me too, my home growing up and especially at my grandparents' home. Also, I have a, a box full of costume jewelry at my mother. I think it was a thing of the time. I still have my box of jewelry like that, but it's interesting. I, I like to read that. Yeah, 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 interesting. Are there any other questions or comments? I'm, I'm very open. Last minute, um, last minute for questions uh, in the chat or Raise your hand, I believe. Um, if not, then I think we'll, we'll end it there. Thank you again so much. Uh, where can people find you? How can people follow along? How can people see some of the stuff you've been oh. working on at Maison Fairview? Yeah, the best way, I'll write it on the chat, is uh, Instagram, okay. Facebook, I'm not too much okay. active. It's A-N-D Shibuki. You can follow me. I'll be more than happy to talk with you, see what you do as well. And um, hold up, uh, imzumushel.com is my website. So you can find me there. I'm not always around town, so it'd be lovely to see you all. But I, I thank everybody for being here. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. Enjoy the, the long weekend. Um, again, if you miss any part of this, it, it is recorded. It'll be up on the SWAS YouTube page probably within a week or so. Uh, it's, a, it's a shorter weekend. But, uh, thank you again, Emery. Yeah, this is uh, fantastic. And the show is uh, yeah. still up all the way until October 31st. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>